But those are our transactions that we're looking at. Um, and so I'll dive into that, um, but how we're trying to um, solve for a uh, solution for our um, technology operations center. So if you see TOC or, or operations center, those are all the same thing. Uh, I'll show you our pipeline, go through a quick little demo of um, what we're actually um, seeing with our forecast and our anomaly detection, uh, some of our enhancements that we've been working on, and then again, driverless as a challenger model um, and almost kind of reverse engineering the process. Uh, next slide. So to start, when we're looking at transactions, there's kind of two main places you'll see um, failures. And on the left, you'll see elevated failure rates. Those are very easy to detect, very easy to measure. Um, you can alert on them. You know, so you can see in this diagram, you can see a large spikes in alerts or in failures. Uh, and you could set thresholds on that um, fairly easily. Um, the other side of it is when you get a low volume anomaly. Um, <clears throat> so. You can see on the right, and I want you to keep this one in mind because we're going to revisit it a little later, but um, can you tell by looking at this picture if it's an anomaly or not? Um, would you alert if you saw that? Um, so you see by the time frame, that's about midnight Eastern um, until 2 a.m. Um, Eastern in, in that snapshot there. Can you tell if there's something anomalous going on or is this normal behavior um, for a given day for that given time period? Um, it's really hard to detect anything in this time period if you're just setting threshold alerts. Um, and so this, in particular, was one of the things we were trying to accomplish with our um, forecasting. Next slide. So as I mentioned, why, why not just set volume alerts? You could do this if you're looking for failures, if there's a certain threshold you want to set for a spike in failures. Um, but if you're looking to set volume alerts for any threshold, you have to set it for, again, as I mentioned, there's hundreds of different transactions we're looking at just for our mobile and our web app applications. Um, you'd have to set it for the time of the day, the day of the week, week of the year. Um, and it easily gets up to you know, close to a million, even more depending if you're trying to scale out um, to even larger number of transactions or different platforms. Um, and it's not sustainable, it's not something you can really manage. Um, and this is where we brought in kind of machine learning um, as our solution. Um, it's something where <clears throat> you can't code the solution effectively if you want to actually be able to maintain it. Um, and it's something you want to be able to scale. So um, next slide. So obviously the, the ML piece of it is always the, the cool thing that everyone wants to see. Um, but in any sort of you know, process we're working on this, the data engineering tends to be 70 to 80% of the actual process, um, whereas the machine learning part of it and the data science tends to be in that you know, 10 to 20 kind of piece. Um, so while we wanted to have a good model and be able to, to get good results, we also wanted to make sure we were um, following some best practices, so following governance. Um, as a large bank, we have a lot of different governance requirements we have to follow. Um, so we wanted to make sure as we're building our model, we're still in the, you know, the safe space that we need to be there. Um, using existing technologies, resources that we have, um, trying to keep everything open sourced. Um, so just so we're not reinventing the wheel as we're going through and just leveraging solid foundations as we're going through it. Um, and ensuring usability and scalability. Um, so it's great you know, for yourself if you build a model and hey, this looks nice. Uh, it's not great if no one uses it. Um, and <clears throat> with that as well, you wanna be able to scale it. So you know, if you've got one single transaction, for example, if we were modeling on that, people might wanna see well, you know, what's happening with the other 150 of them. So being able to build something that's scaled easily, scaled across platforms, across different data types, um, and was also useful for our customers was our main focus. Next slide, uh, we'll dive into um, kind of some of the technology choices we chose. So we're using sparkling water um, as the basis for our, basically our entire pipeline. Um, and we chose it because um, our developers are all basically Python um, developers. So we like that you could implement Python with Spark, with Scala, um, while also being able to utilize H2O. Um, we're doing everything cloud-based, open sourced, um, so being able to do everything in memory was super helpful um, in terms of handling the, the data capacity that we were looking for. Um, and then especially just as we were starting and trying to figure out what kind of model we wanted, um, trying to build the model itself, um, H2O, um, even outside of the sparkling water space, was helpful just in terms of being able to do, um, as I mentioned up there, you know, Cartesian grid searches, which now even AutoML, you can kind of feed in there to let that handle it for you as well. But doing the hyperparameter tuning and just being able to trade between different models and see 
how they're performing, um, especially in Flow, where you could just you know feed in a you know simple data set um, and get results quickly, um, so you know you know if you're going down the right path or not, um, was very helpful for us. Um, another thing that we ended up um, trying to decide on was what type of model to use. Um, we looked at traditional time series, ARIMA, and, and um, a few different things in that space, and ended up actually settling on a GBM. Um, and this was very beneficial for our um, kind of in that scalability space in that we were able to um, build in some explanatory variables, especially across different transactions. So like, you know, login, you might see a particular behavior, but like when make, people make a payment, um, might have a kind of different behavior, and you want to be able to, to account for that. Um, you know, things like paydays, we tend to see a spike, you know, every two, you know, every second Friday, you see a spike when people get paid, and then they tend to pay their credit cards that day. Um, you wouldn't necessarily want to build that in to your logins or, you know, when people are checking their statements because it might not perform the same. Um, but by being able to, to work within the GBM space, we were able to have a little more um, flexibility in the external variables we were building into it. Um, and then this way, we also were able to build in um, an exclusion data set. So we have just a separate <coughs> repo where we keep um, known anomalous points, and we exclude those from our training data set, so we're not training on bad data. So um, this has definitely helped us improve the quality of our, our model as well. Next slide. <coughs> so as I mentioned, we, we sought to build everything open source, cloud-based. Um, so we're using AWS for our um, cloud uh, provider. Um, so we kind of start with S3. Um, we can host some of our static data sets in there. So things like um, payday, holiday calendars, um, and we reference from there. Um, our data for our actual data and our forecast all lives in InfluxDB, which is a time series database. Um, and so we use sparkling water to read from Influx, um, generate a forecast. We write that forecast back to InfluxDB. Um, from there, we run it into uh, Amazon EC2, um, and we have a fairly lightweight unit for, actually for all these pieces, everything's the sparkling water um, instance that we run on the EC2 for our anomaly detection are all fairly lightweight, um, which helps keep costs down as well. Um, but so we take the forecast and the actual data that's sitting in Influx, um, run it through a Python program in, in our EC2 to detect the anomalies, so we're essentially we take the forecast, we build some confidence bands, um, upper and lower limits on it, and then just do a simple calculation of the actual, beyond, you know, if it's outside of those bands. And we do the data viz in Grafana, um, which plays in nicely with Influx. Um, we've tried some other technologies as well, and it, it, a lot of it just comes down to what your preferences are in terms of the time series database and the corresponding um, data visualization um, software that goes with it. But, um, Take a pause. Um, the next part is the data viz side, so I can't really go on without it. Um, I could tell you what the graphs look like, but um, <clears throat> there aren't any questions. Are there? I could take those now. Or Thanks. <clears throat> Next slide. So you probably are curious what it looks like when we actually get through. So this is a snapshot from Grafana. Um, it's a little hard to see probably from, from the distance, but there's a faint green line kind of in the middle of the, the lighter um, green bands. That's our forecast. Um, and the blue line is the actual. So we can track actuals, the, the forecast itself, and then the confidence bands. Um, this is showing kind of a current snapshot, plus we do um, future forecasting, so about a month in advance. So you can, if you want to use it for capacity planning or anything in that space, 
um, you can you know, look at any of these transactions and get an idea of what your volume should look like for that month or so that we're forecasting um, in advance. Um, let me go to the next slide. And then this is an example of when we actually have anomalous behavior. So um, as you see on the bottom, we try to make it as simple as possible for our customers. We have a green kind of band that just says when it's, everything's working fine, it goes to red. Um, when it's anomalous, so just when the, the blue actual line is dropping outside of the confidence bands. Um, we also have this, um, it also triggers an alert um, with another software that sends uh, email, it can send text, um, Slack messages, um, that then goes directly to that operation center. And they can use this for their, um, <clears throat> to essentially troubleshoot and, and get our systems back up. Uh, this is actually a snapshot from that previous slide that we were looking at, um, that second one. So it, it was anomalous behavior. Um, and this is one of those where it's cut off on, on the slide here, but it was about, I think it was about 12% dip. Um, so not a huge drop. And this was from a plan change um, to our streaming data platform. Um, but something went wrong with it um, and it was lowering the volume. So we were able to use this to then show our operation. <laughs> Using these different tools has enabled us to to reduce our mean time to detect, which is our kind of main focus of what we're trying to do. Um, it's just the amount of time it takes us to detect a customer facing um, issue. And then again, from once you're able to detect it faster, then you can resolve it faster. So we've seen drop, um, you know, about 20,000 uh, more logins than expected. And this is one of those where I think when we went in, we initially expected that we were going to see drops, and that was going to be the main way to, to tell there was a, a, you know, an issue, which isn't always the case. So in logins, if there's a problem and you can't log in some customers um, in every minute or so. So you're looking at, you know, over this four-minute time span, you're getting you know, anywhere from you know, 100,000-ish customers back onto your system faster. So um, you know, happier customers plus just being able to actually and actually, in addition to false alarms, we were having an issue with not enough alerts. So there's kind of a balance we were missing with our confidence bands where certain, um, certain time periods, if you wanted to make sure you weren't false alerting, you had to widen them enough where um, when you got to higher volume points, the confidence limits were entire you know, forecast. Um, and that's what you can see on the left side of the, the graph there. Um, our dynamic limits um, start to look at the previous two months, so the time of day and the day of week at each given point, and builds the limits off of that. Um, and as you can see, as we introduce the need, um, <clears throat> had to widen it, um, and it helped you know, avoiding some of the false alarms, and then also getting the narrow points when we had more confidence in the data that we had, um, and there was less fluctuation. Uh, so here you can see the pink was our static limits, and then the green shows our um, dynamic limit confidence bands. Um, and in this example, you know, we're about 20 minutes earlier in detection by having that narrower limit at the higher point without sacrificing anything in the, the lower volume um, aspect of our, our data there. So this is all everything that we have in production now. Um, from here, we kind of wanted to see, um, as I mentioned, we've been working on this for about a year and a half. We wanted to see how if we took driverless um, and took the data set that we're working on, um, how it would compare to everything that we've been engineering and, and working on for a while. So if we go to the next slide. Um, this was using three months of history. So this is looking from January 2018 to March 18 um, and forecasting from April to May. Um, and so just showing, you know, I, I set it at a 10 out of 10 for accuracy and time and let it run. Um, and you can see in terms of the variable importance that, you know, is picking up on, on minute of the day as, as one of the bigger um, importance ones. Um, the orange line is the forecast and the blue is the actuals. Um, and so you can see it catches the shape pretty well, um, which we had issues with as we were um, starting to do our, um, our modeling. It's still a little low. Um, so then I took it, um, we go to the next slide. I, I gave it a whole 15 months worth of history. Um, I dropped the accuracy a bit just in terms of runtime because um, it's a much larger data set. Uh, and here you can see it picked up a lot more um, in terms of some of that growth. Uh, again, the orange is the forecast here. Um, one of the big things that I noticed in terms of the variable importance is that now it's picking up on day of week and minute of the day, um, which we've noticed you got to kind of combine more of the time features together to get a better understanding just because of the variability across days and um, across time of the day. 
Um, still low in some points, but much closer in others. Um, and then, so we go to the next slide. <coughs> Comparison to how our current champion model works. Um, and again, you can actually see our, our current model is also below in some of these points. Um, this was from April 1st um, to about April 8th. So April 1st this year was Easter. So <coughs> that's why you kind of see some um, anomalous behavior there just because holidays give it, give it a little trouble. Um, but overall, if we go to the next slide, um, it, it'll show all four of the models together. There's no single model that's perfect. Um, and you can see there's, you know, each of them kind of hits at certain points and misses at others. Um, but this is one of those things where if we'd started, I think if we'd started with driverless, it certainly would have given us, uh, you know, a good jumping off point and be able to engineer from there, um, which we've seen in some other projects where we've kind of been playing around with it has been one of the biggest benefits for us. So giving you a solid foundation of something to, to work with and build from that versus trying from scratch and kind of tinkering for a while. So, um, that's all I have. If there's any questions, I think we might have a, a minute or so left. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.